you've ever talked about too much of a good thing, or said, it was Greek to me, or I have not slept one wink, or all that glitters is not gold, or the world is your oyster, or love is blind, then you were speaking Shakespeare. You were using phrases invented by the bard himself, and you've used his language without even knowing it. A myth that interferes with our proper understanding and appreciation of Shakespeare is that he supposedly wrote in Old English or Medieval English. He did not. Shakespeare's English is not archaic. Old English is that, for example, used in the poem Beowulf, and is, frankly, completely indiscernible to us today. Thawas on hela heritage togan sweared over setlum seed and money, haven hand fast. Helm ne munda buren and sida thahena se broga and yet. Heo was on ofsta, walder ut thanon, fair bergen, thaw her on funden was. Rather heo adalinga ana havda fasta bifangen, thaw her to fenna gang. Middle English or medieval English is that used in the Canterbury Tales. It is very difficult to read and again is nothing like the language used by Shakespeare. One that April, with his sure is sorta, the drocht of March hath persed to the rota, and bathed every vine in switch liqueur, of which vertu engendred is the floor. Shakespeare's language was modern English, or as some scholars refer to it, early modern English. Certainly the pronunciation was a bit different, but his language is definitely modern. Love's not times full, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bin and sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief oars and wakes, but bears it out e'en to the edge of dumb. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. We must remember that English was still not standardized in Shakespeare's day. Spelling and punctuation were flexible and irregular. Not until 1755 did Samuel Johnson write the first standard dictionary of the English language. Grammar wasn't standardized until the late 1800s. Shakespeare lived and wrote during the language's most glorious and formative years, when its vocabulary was growing at rates unmatched before or since. Nonetheless, what we are reading in Shakespeare is modern English, early modern, but modern English. There are some key differences. Pronunciation varies today between speakers in England and those in America, and even within England between districts and localities. Thus, it shouldn't be difficult to understand why pronunciation in Shakespeare's London was different from ours today. Prove, for example, was pronounced prov, rhyming with love. We see this rhyme in the final couplet of Sonnet 116. Love and prov, jest and great, rhymed with the word eat in Shakespeare's London. Thus, they were pronounced jeest, eat, and greet. Nothing was pronounced noting, hence the pun in the title Much Ado About Nothing, pronounced Much Ado About Noting. Here, Musical notation and overhearing, as in noting what others say, play central themes in the play. The pun of the play is perhaps nowhere better noted than in the exchange between Balthasar and Don Pedro. Balthasar says, Note this before my notes. There's not a note of mine that's worth noting. To which Don Pedro replies, Why, these are the very crotchets that he speaks. Note notes, forsooth and noting. We see another pun on the word nothing being pronounced noting in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Here the pun is a vulgar one. The word noting in Shakespeare's day was also used as a euphemism for what women lacked between their legs, as in, she has no ting. Hamlet purposely misunderstands Ophelia's remarks and makes a vulgar commentary in the following lines. Ophelia says, I think, noting, my lord. Hamlet replies, that's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. What is, my lord, replies Ophelia. Hamlet then says, no ting. 
Death and debt were also homophones, death being pronounced debt. Hence the pun in Shakespeare's Henry IV, Part Two, when Francis Feeble declares, By my troth, I care not. A man can die but once. We owe God a debt. Our and whore were both pronounced or, making them homophones as well. And ripe was pronounced rape. Hence, Jacques laughs in As You Like It when he recites Touchstone's existential observation that "'Tis but an or go since it was nine, and after one or more it would be eleven, and so from or to or we ripe and ripe, and from or to or we rot and rot, and thereby hangs the tale." This is depressingly existential in our pronunciation, but clearly vulgar and meant to be comical in early modern pronunciation. Another play on words can be seen in Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, where the characters continually use the word gentile, as in a non-Jew, as synonymous with the word gentle, as in being kind and civil. Thus, Shylock is told, we all expect a gentile answer, Jew. Some vocabulary also held different meanings in Shakespeare's day. For example, the words an and and actually meant if. A chorus in Shakespeare's plays is really just a single person who makes commentary. Humor meant mood. A natural was a fool or an idiot or sometimes a bastard. Tonight actually means last night, and if a character is called silly, he's actually being called innocent. Shakespeare sometimes even made up his own grammar. Almost any part of speech could be used for any other part of speech. For example, he says, he childed as I fathered. He also writes, she hath made compare, or a seldom pleasure. The difference between Shakespearean adjectives and ours is the use of the redundant more or most with the comparative or the superlative, as in some more fitter place, or this was the most unkindest cut of all. Perhaps most significant in our understanding of Shakespeare's language is understanding that the use of pronouns connote intimacy or rank. These are preserved in Renaissance literature. Ye, or you, was a formal pronoun used with acquaintances or those higher in social rank, while the thou or thee was an informal pronoun used with close friends and relatives or with those of lower social rank. Pronouns are thus used primarily to establish rank. For example, Hamlet constantly refers to Claudius as ye or you, because although Claudius is his uncle and now stepfather, Claudius is still a king and must be addressed with the respectful formal pronoun ye or you. On the other hand, Hamlet addresses his close friend Horatio as thou or thee. Horatio is not only a close friend, but he's also of lower social rank. By contrast, Horatio uses ye and you when addressing Hamlet, who is, after all, a prince, someone higher in social rank. For reasons not yet satisfactorily explained, Elizabethans continued to use thou in addresses to God and supernatural figures such as ghosts. Thus, consider how Hamlet uses the thou and the thee when speaking to the ghost as he first encounters it. But when he sees the ghost toward the end of the play, Hamlet switches to using ye and you, indicating that he has accepted the ghost finally as that of his father and king. From this switch in pronoun use, we know that Hamlet did not immediately accept the ghost as that of his father in the beginning of the play, and that only after Hamlet's mousetrap, or play within the play, did he believe that the ghost was genuine and could be trusted, and was indeed his father, the king, meriting the use of ye, or you. Pronouns are also sometimes used to show contempt. For example, in Twelfth Night, when Sir Toby Belch coaches Sir Andrew Aguecheek to challenge to a duel, he instructs him, Taunt him with the license of ink, if thou thouest him some thrice, 
it shall not be amiss. Pronouns are also used to ingratiate oneself to another. Consider this speech in which Claudius, king of Denmark, speaks to Laertes. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit, Laertes. You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? Note the switch in pronouns in this simple little excerpt. First, Claudius begins with using the you, and then switches to using the thou and thy. Also, he begins with using the royal we, us, as in speaking of himself in the singular, but then switches to the single personal pronoun, my. We see now in this one excerpt a switch from a very formal address to a very informal, personal conversation. Understanding Shakespeare can be difficult, but the following strategies, I believe, will prove helpful. First, read the footnotes. The footnotes are your friends. They will help you understand the plays better. Next, read the play twice. First, to get a general idea of what's happening, and then second, to appreciate the nuances and language of the play. Thirdly, keep a photocopy of the cast list handy. There are often large lists of characters in Shakespeare's plays, and it's difficult to keep track of who is who and who's speaking to whom. Next, read the passages aloud. By reading these passages aloud, not only do you understand them better, but you gain a better appreciation for Shakespeare's language. Next, try summarizing what you've read. As you summarize what you've read each evening, you begin to piece together the story. Next, write down questions. As you write down these questions, you'll remember them when you engage in discussions with your classmates and with me. And then watch it being performed. If you cannot see it being performed live on stage, rent a, rent a video. Uh, watch it on Netflix. Find it in a movie form so that you can see it being performed. Then you can truly appreciate these works which were meant to be seen and not merely read. Lastly, read a side-by-side -side presentation of a quarto and folio material when they are available. As we already discussed, half of Shakespeare's plays appeared in quarto form before they ever made it to the 1623 folio. Reading a side-by-side -side comparison can give you insights that you would miss otherwise. Armed with these strategies, you will surely come to understand Shakespeare's plays and appreciate his genius.